Thank you for joining us this afternoon at Hudson Institute as we host the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Finland, Elena, get this right, Veltonen, is that right? Um, my name is John Walters. I am President and CEO of Hudson Institute. We are honored to have the Minister here with us today as she closes out um, a new chapter in the close relationship between the United States and Finland. The relationship has been close for decades but it's taken on new importance with the threats to Europe and the war in Ukraine. Uh, Finland, as many of you in this audience know, has a great co uh, track record of close cooperation, especially on defense procurement with the United States. Even before joining NATO uh, earlier this year, Finland served alongside U.S. forces in Afghanistan and has conducted uh, regular joint military exercises with U.S. and fin Finnish forces. As the minister is in Washington this week, um, the purpose is in part to sign a new defense cooperation treaty between our two countries that will take that cooperation to a new level. Thank you. Helsinki has also been cleared eye about the threats and challenges posed to Europe by China, especially regarding Beijing's attempts to enter the European 5G market. However, it is Finland's support in Ukraine since the Russian large-scale invasion in February 2022 that sets it apart from other U.S. allies. Finland has given more than 20 military aid packages totaling billions of euros since the war started. This places them among the top 10 contributors to Ukraine when measured as percentage of GDP. Last week, Finland also announced that it will, double, it will be doubling the production of military artillery shells in the coming years to steadily supply the Ukraine need. America and NATO need more allies like Finland. With so great, it, so this is why it's such a great pleasure for us and an honor to host the minister here at the podium to deliver some remarks about the state of the U.S.-Finnish relations and the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine from the point of view of her government and people. Following her remarks, my colleague Luke Coffey, Coffey, senior fellow of the Center for Europe and Eurasia, will moderate a discussion. But now. Please join me in welcoming the minister. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, CEO President, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to visit the Hudson Institute today during my first official visit to the United States. A new era has begun in Finland's foreign and security policy. I want to wholeheartedly thank for the unwavering support the United States showed during the accession process to NATO. NATO remains the strongest alliance in history. As in the past, NATO will stand the test of time in safeguarding the freedom and security of our allies and contributing to peace and security. I want to underline Finland's strong commitment to the alliance. Finnish NATO membership strengthens not only Northern European security and stability, but makes the entire alliance stronger. We are putting to use our strong defense capabilities, resilience, and broad know-how ranging from emerging technologies to Arctic conditions. Finland's and soon Sweden's NATO membership means that the Baltic Sea and the Arctic region form a new, continuous strategic space for NATO's defense and deterrence. We fully recognize the need for each and every ally to contribute to NATO's 360-degree 300, approach. Finland participated in NATO's crisis management operations in Afghanistan, Kosovo, and Iraq already as a partner and continues to do so as an ally. We are also ready to participate in NATO's collective peacetime missions and will decide on our part in due course. We stress the importance of sharing the burden. The Finnish government already spends more than 2% of GDP on defense. With our own example, we encourage all, all allies to do the same. Next year, 19 allies will meet the 2% defense spending floor compared with only a few some 10, 10 years ago, which is, a, which is a sign of strong and increasing commitment. Dear listeners, as an ally, the Finnish government puts an even 
greater emphasis on strategic partnerships and their role in our security and prosperity. We have a joint opportunity to take the US-Finland cooperation to the next level. Finland is a heavyweight ally for the United States in defense, technology, and democracy. Our bilateral ties have long roots, and the bond between Finland and the United States has continued to deepen during the past years. The US is our most significant trade partner. Our goal is to further encourage cooperation between Finnish and US business and academic communities. We have a long history of working together and therefore a solid base of mutual trust and shared experience. Our bilateral defense cooperation agreement is one clear example of this. The DCA will create a clear platform and fra framework for us to cooperate in all security situations. This will help us deter and defend together and contribute to wider NATO objectives. We are also committed to advancing cooperation in emerging technologies. They offer great opportunities for our societies, especially in the field of technology and critical infrastructure. Cooperation with trusted partners is essential. Indeed, we are already working with the US, for example, on quantum and 6G. Ladies and gentlemen, the further we look into the future, the more difficult it is to disentangle security policy from a flourishing economy, technology, and innovation. The protection of our values demands that we remain competitive on a global scale. As geopolitical competition intensifies, it is crucial that the EU and the US deepen their ties in all fields in order to strengthen the resilience of our societies and economies. This also and very much means free trade between ourselves. We should, add, we should aim at treating the Euro-Atlantic sphere as a market of the like-minded. We should not raise trade barriers onto the Atlantic or neither side of it. We should aim at a level playing field for all companies, big or small, in the Euro-Atlantic community. The free exchange of goods, services, capital and ideas also attracts the best talent. In the long term, we cannot subsidize or isolate ourselves into success. A transparent and efficient market economy has always been the trademark of the West, creating and spreading prosperity and opening new horizons for all people. It leads to competitiveness, which we, again, need also for geopolitical reasons. Distinguished guests, the Middle East has been at the center of our attention since the horrible terrorist attack on October 7. Finland has strongly condemned the attack by the terrorist organization Hamas against Israel. The hostages must be released unconditionally and without delay. Israel has the right to defend its civilian population it is crucial that it does so adhering to international humanitarian law. All civilians must be protected, and the civilian population throughout Gaza needs more humanitarian aid with utmost urgency. We support the UN Secretary General's call for the UN Security Council to act. The situation underlines the need for a negotiated two-state solution that creates stability for the entire region. This goal re will require close cooperation between the US, Europe, and Arab countries. In the meantime, we must protect the viability of the two-state solution, which includes strengthening the Palestinian Authority and calling on Israel to prevent settler violence. Ladies and gentlemen, I visited Ukraine in October together with my EU colleagues and met with President Zelensky. The bravery and determination of our Ukrainian friends is heroic. The war has already been long and grinding, and the second winter of war has started. The Ukrainians are fighting for their survival. They are also fighting for our values and principles. This is not just a Western viewpoint. A vast majority of countries has condemned Russia's actions 
in UN General Assembly's reso resolutions. By attacking Ukraine, Russia committed a monumental strategic error. Russia underestimated both the Ukrainians' will to defend their country and the unity of the Western country, countries to stand with Ukraine. It is our collective responsibility to ensure that the support stays strong. Putin thought he would take Kiev in days. It's almost been two years now, and there's barely anyone in Russia who would applaud the war or call it a success. Ukraine has prevailed because of the strong support it has got from Europe and the US, but also because the Ukrainians, unlike the Russians, know what they are fighting for. Ukraine is fighting for their very existence and the liberty of their children. For us in the West, aiding Ukraine is not charity. Ukraine is defending our way of life and the civilized world as we know it. Let me, let me be clear, Finland stands firmly with Ukraine for as long as it's needed. In relation to GDP, we are one of the strongest donors to Ukraine. We are in the process of preparing another military aid package, the 21st so far. Finland, together with the other Nordic countries, has expressed its readiness to support Ukraine and its security also in the long term, building on the joint declaration by G7 countries on security commitments. Ukraine continues to need the support of the international community. The US contribution will be key. Together, the bilateral NATO and EU efforts will ensure that Ukraine is in the strongest possible position when the war ends. Ukraine will also need to win the peace after winning the war. We support Ukraine's initiative for just and lasting peace and a peace formula summit. We need to ensure the broadest possible international participation in these efforts. China bears its responsibility too. As a self-proclaimed responsible global power, stressing the importance of the UN Charter, sovereignty and territorial integrity, it could and should use its leverage on Russia. We need China to speak for the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine and to engage with Ukraine's efforts towards peace. We also need to make China understand the consequences if it doesn't refrain from support to Russia and its war of aggression, be it political, economic or technological. As allies, it is clear that we must, must all reject Russia's notions of spheres of influence. There can be no compromise over the sovereignty of any state. Concessions only feed the aggression of Russia in its current posture. A free, democratic and prosperous Ukraine will be the best guarantee against future aggressions of any autocracy. Dear listeners, during the past two years, we have seen that there are very few restraints for Russia's aggressive behavior. We see that Russia will remain a threat to global security for the foreseeable future. Russia is also trying to distract us, distract us from its illegal war of aggression and to sow disaccord in our societies. This is what we have seen recently on Finland's eastern border, where Russia has intentionally pushed third country citizens to the Finnish border zone. By choosing and even mobilizing people to pass without valid documentation, Russia is threatening Finnish national security. This hybrid operation needs to be seen as Russia's attempt to weaponize migration, but also in the context of Russia's aggression in Europe. Finland's border with Russia is also that of the EU and NATO. Finland's recent decision to close all border crossing points towards Russia shows that we are determined in our response. The West has never been as united as it is now. Both NATO and the EU continue to attract new member candidates. There's a queue to join and for a good reason. NATO and the EU are a source of peace, security and prosperity. They will stand the test of time in safeguarding this important mission. 
Also, Ukraine's future is Europe, European and Euro-Atlantic. We need to ensure continuity and momentum towards the Washington summit as regards Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic aspirations. Finland welcome, welcomes opening EU accession negotiations with Ukraine, and we will support Ukraine in the needed reforms. Ladies and gentlemen, unlike Russia, NATO and the EU do not enlarge by force. It is the free people in democratic nations choosing to join. To join. This is a fundamental difference to how autocrats think and act. Russia's cruel illegal war has, in all its wickedness, opened our eyes and, and given new momentum to those defending freedom. Once you are in danger of losing something so essential, you truly understand its value. As the former US President Ronald Reagan once said, freedom is a fragile thing, and it's never more than one generation away from extinction. It is not ours by way of inheritance. It must be fought for and defended, defended constantly by each generation, for it comes only once to a people. We should hold high the beacon of hope in Finland, we know what we are talking about. And more than ever, we need to underline our common values, human rights, democracy, and the rule of law, which are put to the test as we speak. Thank you for your attention. Looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Minister, thank you for that. We had a strong message on free trade. We had strong and encouraging words about NATO and NATO enlargement. We had a robust message about Ukraine. At the Hudson Institute, we couldn't ask for anything better. So thank you so much. That was music to, uh, to my ears and I'm sure the ears of, of my colleagues here in the audience. Uh, you, you mentioned that this is your first visit to Washington um, in the official capacity. And on your very first visit, you signed such a historic uh, defense cooperation agreement uh, with the United States. I can't imagine very many foreign ministers get that privilege on their first official visit. So I guess we can assume that every visit will be like this, right? Every, <laughs> some, Next time it will be the peace treaty for Middle East. Yeah, yeah, yeah so let's hope, let's hope. And I, I loved, uh, and, uh, I, I know I just mentioned it, but I did love that free trade message that I think is... Uh, often lacking here in, in the United States right now. We often forget to explain the, the benefits of, of free trade. And uh, I, I like your uh, market of the like-minded for the uh, North Atlantic, transatlantic region. Um, that's one of the strongest messages we find on explaining to Americans why what happens in Ukraine matters, that Europe and North America together are about 48% of the global economy and Europe is America's largest export market. So what happens in Ukraine can impact not only the US, but the American worker. So thank you for making that, uh, that message. But going back to the, um, the defense cooperation agreement, uh, there's been bits and pieces reported in, in the media, a lot of talk about um, American access to, I think, 15 different locations and facilities. Uh, what are, in your opinion, what are the highlights of this agreement? Uh, what does this do in practice that already wasn't happening between US and Finland? Well, <clears throat> um, as noted, of course, our um, ties also, what comes to uh, defense cooperation um, have uh, intensified over the course of the past years and uh, obviously ever since we joined, joined NATO. But I, I guess the, the true meaning of the DCA is that, uh, that it really brings to flesh the fact that we are now in an alliance and that we have a legal framework on how we uh, organize ourselves around the fact. And of course, um, if there's uh, um, US uh, well, troops or materials or whichever which have to be um, stored or, or 
have, need to have access to Finland. And of course, what comes to the movement also in our country, there have to be rules for that. Um, so it's just easier that everything's now agreed upon. Uh, and that's a basis that can be built on. And uh, one thing that stood out to me, um, I noticed that uh, a number of these facilities that the U.S. Uh, can work with your country on uh, storage and preposition and, and whatnot are located in, in the north, in, in Lapland. And the, the first thing that immediately stuck out to me was um, the, 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 the self-imposed limitations that you know, Norway puts on NATO activity in, um, in East Finnmark. Uh, was there any domestic debate about how this agreement with the United States, this basically um, you know, open door for US-Finland cooperation across all different regions of Finland, was there any debate or controversy about this uh, as it pertains to Russia? Or in light of what Russia did to Ukraine in February of 2022, these matters are settled and that the Finnish people are, are quite happy with this sort of arrangement with the United States? Um, well, the Finns as a whole are pretty satisfied with, with this agreement, but of course uh, we strongly focus on our sovereignty and it's, it's also, uh, um, or it has significance in, in, in the um, agreement or the negotiated agreement uh, as well. Uh, but I don't think those two things contradict each other. Um, of course, now that we are in the same alliance, uh, we are there to help each other. Uh, and that's how we um, see that the U.S. operations would be also in the region. And of course, um, we obviously hope uh, that this uh, helps in uh, bringing our deterrence to the level that there never will be another conflict where we would really have to uh, put things uh, into practice. So in that sense, I think it's, of course, mutually beneficial. And now that all the Nordic, Nordic countries have, uh, or this week was also Denmark will be, will be um, signing the agreement, then it just means that um, we have the same procedures for, for the entire Northern Europe. Great. And uh, moving to, to NATO, you mentioned in your remarks that there is this, this big summit, 75th anniversary summit uh, for NATO being held next summer here in Washington. Uh, it will be a historic occasion for no other reason than the fact that it is the 75, 75th anniversary. Uh, but there'll be one topic on everyone's mind, uh, and that's Ukraine. Uh, what should that relationship be between NATO and Ukraine? How do we get the path to Ukrainian membership into the alliance? A lot of people were disappointed at the last summit. Um, I took maybe a slightly rosier picture of, of the last summit and thought that that was a, a very good first step that we could build on for this bigger summit. Um, when you consider the issue of Ukrainian membership or any of the other issues facing NATO, in general terms, what does Finland consider a What would Finland consider to be a success? How would you consider um, the next summit successful in, in your opinion? I think first and foremost, unity. Um, that uh, NATO shows that it's uh, credible, as credible it's, as it's ever been. And I think, uh, NATO really, and that went to show also last summer or, or already in Madrid, is that um, there's, you know, there's this sense of purpose again. It's it's back there, and uh, NATO really sh has shown the resolve which is needed in in this time where there is not re not 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 only uh, a credible threat in in Europe towards our security, but actually a war. Um, so in that sense, I think everybody is, uh, in the broad sense, looking in the right direction. Um, the second thing is, of course, that uh, we strongly support um, burden sharing. Um, we, we are doing our bit. We spend 2.4% this year, uh, and we'll be keeping it well above 2% uh, each year also for, for the foreseeable future. Um, by, by this, we encourage, of course, all our, especially European friends, do the same. And I think it's been ticking up 
quite nicely uh, also over the course of the past past years that uh, people, especially ever since the full-scale invasion by Russia, that uh, countries and politicians have realized that uh, this is not just an abstract um, number or, or an abstract um, capability level that we need to be reaching, but it's really something that, that um, might be might be needed, so that's for one. And what comes to Ukraine, um, I think now in the short to medium term, the main thing is is that we just have to keep on aiding them, keep on supporting them. Uh, it doesn't become any cheaper in the future. And what the consequences are if, if we don't do it, uh, it's difficult to imagine. And I'm not only speaking about Russia, how Russia might feel emboldened feel emboldened like it's already kind of now feeling, but how, let's say, countries who do act in the same manner or think in the same manner, the autocracies out there, what they might, you know, draw as a conclusion out of it. I, I'm not sure uh, we want to gamble with that. So, yes, and what comes to Ukraine's NATO membership there has to be a credible pathway. I think also Vilnius, like you say, Luke, I, I think it was a good conference. I think the outcome was good. So it's very much also about expectation management. Um, so we have to be dealing with that. Uh, but also that now that uh, last week uh, the European Union uh, opened the, the, the talks with, uh, or the membership accession talks with, with Ukraine, and that's a credible pathway that will also help Ukraine in achieving the NATO criteria one day, which is not, um, well, we can't set the date yet. Of course. And uh, on the theme of NATO enlargement, I want to turn to your, your neighbor, Sweden. Um, for years, uh, I, I, I was advocating for um, the U.S. to keep a, that open door inside NATO for Finnish and Swedish membership. I, uh, in my, all of my writings, I would always emphasize that ultimately it's the decision of the Finnish people or the Swedish people. But from a, a U.S. point of view, it would be in our interest that you joined. When I would travel the region and I would speak to policymakers at the time in Helsinki, I was always told, well, Sweden's going to join first. And then we'll, then we'll think about joining. Well, we now know what happened. <laughs> You're in, and the, the Swedes are still trying. And we're all hoping that uh, this issue with Turkey and, and now seemingly Hungary gets, gets resolved. Um, but what's your take uh, as, uh, as you know, Sweden's neighbor, Sweden's <coughs> partner, um, the newest member in NATO? I know uh, your government has been involved um, in the public eye, behind the scenes, in every which way, uh, encouraging um, a, a, a resolution to this impasse on getting Sweden across the finish line and into NATO. What, what is your take on the current state of affairs with this issue? Well, we of course would have hoped that would have happened right on the same day that we were, oh, that we became members, but uh, now, <laughs> Um, let's just hope it happens by the end of the year, and now it could actually be possible. Um, well, the um, membership application uh, is now, well, of course, with Hungary and Turkey. Hungary has said that they are not going to be the last ones. Um, and Turkey, uh, uh, they have uh, sent the proposal already to Parliament, and it's now with the Foreign Affairs Committee, who apparently will be... Um, having meetings later this week. So let's hope it goes, for, goes forward. Yeah, let's hope um, sooner the better uh, with that. Uh, on Ukraine, um, you mentioned the, the great work and the important contribution that Finland has made to Ukraine's uh, national defense. Um, and it's a great example, especially at a time in Washington where we're still having more political debates on additional aid and how much aid and what type of aid we should be delivering to Ukraine. So that message you give here in Washington is so important right now. But how would you, um, how would you rate the level of support across Finnish society for these continued uh, military aid packages? You mentioned your, there's been 20, we're planning the 21st. Um, as you 
point out this is um, only going to become more expensive over time. Uh, we talked about expectations. Expectations last spring on the counteroffensive were um, unnecessarily high. And now we're also dealing with the, the, you know, managing the expectations for what's going to happen in 2024. What's the political debate like in Finland? The mood of the public, the mood of your parliament, the, the, the feeling, and I know you won't share the details of cabinet meetings, but amongst the cabinet members, uh, is there um, steady support? Is it being questioned? How do you see this going forward? The Finnish people are very unified in this, uh, and it's probably because of our own history. Um, back in the Second World War, uh, the Winter War, we were invaded by Russia, and we literally weren't helped by anybody. And uh, of course, uh, well, now we sense that the Ukraine is like we had the, you, you know, we wanted to protect our country and and remain independent and. Our um, grandparents back then, they knew what they were fighting for. And now the Ukrainians, they know that too. So there's also this will of, you know, um, defending your country, which is extremely important besides all the military uh, materials that you need for it and all the ammunition that you need, which is, of course, hugely important um, as well. But there's a strong unity among the Finnish people. If you ask a man and woman on the street, everybody uh, is strongly in favor, and uh, that is also across the political parties um, at at this stage. And it's probably um, not just because of our past, but we can also sense that. Um, I mean, if if Russia is not stopped now, what comes next? In shifting uh, north to the Arctic, um, the Arctic Council uh, has, for the most part, ceased operating from day to day in the aftermath of Russia's large-scale invasion. Even after Russia's annexation of Crimea in 2014, the Arctic Council as an institution still functioned. Of course, uh, the Arctic Council consisting of the, of the different Arctic states, in, including Russia. Um, what is the future? Uh, of of this organization of uh, of cooperation in the region, it, it seems to me that it's inconceivable that under the current geopolitical circumstances, an organization like the Arctic Council can function as it was originally designed. But yet, there are so many issues we face in the Arctic together as Arctic nations that we have to you know, find a way to continue the uh, cooperation, at least among the, the seven countries that, you know, ex excluding Russia and the Arctic Council, the other seven countries. Um, from Finland's national point of view, how do you assess the future of the Arctic Council or the future of Arctic cooperation? Well, essentially, uh, I guess the Arctic cooperation becomes um, more important by the day. Um, the Arctic already now is strategically a hugely important region. And um, what comes to the Arctic Council originally, it, it wasn't even designed for, for solving any security issues in itself. So um, for that purpose, um, now, of course, we support Norway, who has held the, chair, the chairship now, and uh, they have found a way to somehow meddle through with Russia with the written, written procedure and everything. But, of course, the organization itself is a little bit crippled uh, because of Russia's actions and, and behavior. But, but all in all, I think um, the focus in NATO and, uh, again, between us like-minded countries uh, is strongly in the Arctic uh, and will probably be uh, increasingly so in the future. And we are happy to contribute with our knowledge. And I noticed in the last uh, strategic concept that NATO published um, last summer, or the summer of 2022, um, there was, for the first time, a reference to the, to the high north. Um, and I think that was notable. And it's something that many of us in Washington have been calling on for a while, wanting NATO to, as an institution, to focus more on that region. I think it was inevitable, considering that to, well, Finland and then hopefully Sweden soon will you know, we'll be in the alliance. And that brings seven out of the eight 
Arctic states under the same security umbrella. And even though the Arctic Council doesn't focus on security issues, um, nevertheless, having seven out of eight under the same security alliance means that that alliance does have to address those issues. So that was uh, positive. But speaking of um, these uh, other regional groupings, many U.S commentators and policymakers and Hill staff may not be familiar with some of the regional groupings that Finland is a part of that does great work, like the Nordic Council of Ministers, the, the, the Northern Group, or from a more a military security side of things, the Jeff. Um, what can you tell us about how these are progressing in, in this new security environment, in this new geopolitical environment with uh, Russia and Russia's invasion of Ukraine? And are there any messages you would like to give to U.S. policymakers on how we can engage with these groupings better uh, to ensure closer cooperation with our allies across the Atlantic? Well, we are very close with the Nordic countries, so um, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Iceland, uh, but of course with the Baltics as well. So we have uh, this group N5, which are the Nordics, and then N NB8, which is then together with the three, three Baltics, Baltic countries as well. Uh, we have many, many, many um, agenda points, but of course um, security and defense have become uh, increasingly important, and now that... Uh, once Sweden finally gets in, uh, everybody is in NATO as well, uh, and most of us are in the European Union as well. Norway, not Iceland, not. But otherwise, um, we have a very, very broad shared agenda. So uh, I'm welcoming the United States to reach out <laughs> any time you, you you want on on any of these issues. And now I think it just becomes. Um, um, also easier, not only for for our cooperation in the region. But in essence, what, what, what NATO should be about and is about is about effective deterrence. And the stronger we are in the region and the better interoperable we are um, and uh, the more we can, we can do together before crisis hits, then it could be that the crisis never hits. And I, I think our message to the United States is, States is as well that you know, we take care of our bit. That's, I mean, we are, we are not free riders at all. Um, we, we spend, um, we not only spend money into defense, but we also try to do it, you know, in a smart way that we can do things together across the Baltic, Baltic region, also in the Arctic, um, and hopefully um, in the future also better within the European Union that we need to, you know, uh, more effective in, in the use of um, our military capabilities, but also we need to invest into a defense industry. But we also need the U.S. Uh, and uh, I think the transatlantic tie that uh, we've had over, over the decades, it's, it's so important. And why the tie is so strong as well is, is not just because of the prosperity and the wealth, which is also important. Like I said in my speech, we need... We need more market economy also between ourselves in order to be able to prosper and be relevant also in the future from that perspective. But it's because of our values. And I think every time, and also when people say that, you know, the democratic nations that we are now, you know, dying out and, and it's, it's cooler to be an autocrat or something. If, if you give a person the, the possibility to really to choose a human being will always choose freedom. And that's why I think our tie and our bond is, is stronger, whatever comes. But of course we need to be investing into that and hopefully that we wouldn't have to endure any more wars that we have in Europe or in the world today. We have time for uh, maybe one or two quick questions. If, if anyone, uh, if raise your hand, catch my eye. We have a microphone. All right, I see. We'll go to the gentleman in the back and then the gentleman in the front, and then we'll wrap it up. If you could please uh, state your name and any relevant affiliation you might have, that'd be great. Uh, my name is Roger Cochetti, and I have no particular affiliation. I'm, uh, my question is the long term, the, uh, it, within the Finnish leadership, what is their perspective towards the long term solution in Ukraine? Is it complete? 
uh, defeat by Russia with the promise that we're so sorry, we'll never do anything like this again? Is it regime change in Russia with uh, uh, Putin being put up on trial for war crimes? Is it chopping the country in half so that there's, you know, old Ukraine and new Ukraine? What, 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 is the lo- what, what I think many people are missing is sort of what's the realistically achievable long-term objective and I'm not sure how publicly you could speak about it, but to the extent you can, it would help educate all of us. Thank you. Well, public, publicly or no, um, Ukraine as an independent country um, who has the full right to sovereignty and territorial integrity based on the UN Charter is in the best position themselves, and they are the only ones to decide what is, you know, an acceptable uh, situation. And uh, what comes to all other solutions, then I don't think anybody should be in the position to impose any sort of um, peace, uh, you know, um, well, what, what it should look like, but it should be up to the Ukrainians to decide. And I think we have the moral responsibility to help them to achieve the best negotiating position possible. And then the gentleman, the gentleman in the front here. Thank you very much. Scott Seaman with Mitsui. Um, my other affiliation is my great-great-grandmother came from Finland in 1890. So <laughs> That's um, a very important affiliation, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Maybe more important than Mitsui. Uh, I just wanted to ask you if you would comment comment on uh, energy security policy in Finland and especially how you view Russia as part of that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Very important question um, for all of Europe. Well, in electricity production, Finland is almost 100% independent and we look to invest very heavily into uh, electricity production also for the future in order to you know help our industries but also to be able to invest into hydrogen and also to export um, energy uh, in that form. So um, we do nuclear, but we do a lot of renewables, and we aim to be climate neutral by 2035 already. So we are pretty uh, ambitious in that. So, so yeah, we don't have basically any ties to Russia anymore What comes to the energy front. Um, yeah. Great. Well, Minister, I know you have a packed schedule. schedule. You are pressed for time. I I just want to thank you sincerely for taking time out of your busy schedule to come here to Hudson. And I want to congratulate you and your country for uh, the signing of the Defense Cooperation Agreement. I know it makes America safer to have allies and partners uh, like Finland. So we are very grateful for that. And to our online viewers and our uh, uh, in-audience members, thank you so much for taking time coming here to listen to this important discussion today. You can find more of our work and uh, more of our events on Hudson.org. Thank you so much and have a good afternoon.